This video is the second part of the series on the defense of Sihong Warehouse. If you haven't watched part 1, I highly recommend you watch that video first. I have included the link in the description. Late on the evening of October 26th and into the morning of October 27th, units from the 1st Battalion of the 524th Regiment began moving towards their new positions at Sihong Warehouse. The 524th Regiment was part of the 262nd Brigade, which itself was one of the two brigades that made up the 88th Division. Sihang Warehouse had been the divisional headquarters of the 88th during the Battle of Shanghai. As Chinese forces began to withdraw from downtown Shanghai, this lone battalion was going to stay behind and fight the Japanese troops in the city. However, things did not start off well for the 1st Battalion. It proved extremely difficult to locate the four different companies that made up the 1st Battalion since they were scattered along the front lines. This was problematic as all orders had to be transmitted by runners or messengers. If a messenger was unable to find a unit, this meant that the particular unit would not be able to receive the new orders to stay and defend their new positions. Initially, the battalion commander, Major Yang Ruifu, was only able to locate troops from the machine gun company as well as 1st and 2nd platoon of 1st company. There was no news of the 2nd company, 3rd company, or 1st company's 3rd platoon. A while later, 2nd company showed up at the designated assembly point at Mongolia Road, and with there still being no sign of the other missing units, Major Yang decided to set out with the 2nd company towards Sihang Warehouse and met up with the deputy regiment commander, Lieutenant Colonel Xie Jingyuan, who was already there. Major Yang then realized to his dismay that the machine gun company, which he had previously located, had not shown up at the warehouse. In addition, the 3rd Company, as well as the 3rd Platoon of 1st Company, had not received any of the new orders. With Chinese forces pulling out of downtown Shanghai and being unable to contact their battalion commander, these units had decided to retreat with the other battalions of the 524th Regiment. As they retreated, they came across personnel from the regimental headquarters who informed them of the order for the 1st Battalion to defend Sihong Warehouse. And thus, after a chaotic start, by 9 a.m. on October 27th, most of the men from the 1st Battalion had arrived at Sihong Warehouse. One notable absence is the commander of 1st Company, Captain Shang Guan Zhibiu. He was not with his unit as they moved towards Sihong Warehouse, and as a result, command of 1st Company was temporarily given to one of its platoon commanders named Tao Xingchun. When Captain Shang Guan arrived at the warehouse a day later on the 28th, command was then transferred back to him. His absence has caused quite a bit of confusion over the years, and many official sources incorrectly named Tao Xingchun as the actual 1st Company commander. However, even before all the units had arrived at the warehouse, the first shots of the day had already been fired. A platoon commander named Yin Qiucheng had been given command of two squads of men and sent to guard a bridge over the railroad tracks around Shanghai North Station. From this position, the soldiers would be able to observe Japanese movements in the area and would spot any Japanese unit moving towards the warehouse. By 7.30 a.m., Japanese troops had been spotted advancing west towards the station, and by 8.15 a.m., Japanese troops had occupied the station building. At this point, the Chinese troops guarding the bridge opened fire at the Japanese, halting their advance. The Chinese troops continued firing at the Japanese for two hours before they retreated back towards the warehouse around 10 a.m. As the last units were arriving at Sihon Warehouse, preparations were already being made for the coming battle. After surveying the area around the warehouse, Major Yang ordered the 1st Company to defend the right flank along Tibet Road, while the 3rd Company was ordered to defend the left flank around the Bank of Communications building. The second company was stationed between the first and third companies and was tasked with providing security for the warehouse itself. Outside the warehouse, pillboxes and fortifications had been built and anti-tank obstacles lined the streets. Using the materials found within the warehouse, 
the defenders also piled bags filled with beans and grain around the gates to the warehouse, as well as around windows within the warehouse. These bags would act as sandbags and protect the vulnerable areas. Lights within the warehouse were also destroyed to prevent them from illuminating the defenders, and buildings around the warehouse were set on fire. Two machine guns from the machine gun company were placed on the roof to act in an anti-aircraft role, while the rest of the machine gun company was assigned to reinforce the first and third companies, which were defending the flanks. Around 1 p.m., some Japanese troops were spotted west of the warehouse. They were advancing east along North Suzhou Creek Road and was near the Bank of Communications building. Chinese soldiers from 3rd Company promptly opened fire and after killing a few Japanese soldiers, forced the rest to retreat. Additional fortifications had been set up along North Suzhou Creek Road. However, these were constructed prior to the war with Japan and were for preventing attacks from the international settlement. Thus, the fortifications were facing towards the warehouse and couldn't be used by the defenders. To prevent the Japanese from using these against Chinese troops, Major Young ordered them to be rigged with explosives, which consisted of multiple grenades and a single mortar shell. As Japanese troops entered it, the explosives were triggered, killing many of them. At 2.30 p.m., Japanese troops returned, this time numbering around 40 to 50 men, with more on their way. At this point, after exchanging fire with the enemy and suffering a few casualties in the process, all Chinese troops outside the warehouse were ordered to withdraw inside. The fighting continued as Japanese troops surrounded the warehouse, with some trying to break their way in through the gates and windows, while others attempted to provide suppressing fire. Chinese troops fought ferociously from within the warehouse to stop them from breaking in, with the commander of 3rd Company, Captain Shi Mei Hao, being wounded in the process. In his memoirs, Major Yang said, At 3 p.m., Company Commander Shi Mei Hao was shot through the face with blood gushing out of his wound. Yet, using a handkerchief to apply pressure, he did not leave his post. Soon after, this company commander's leg was also pierced by a machine gun round. I had no choice but to order him to leave his position and rest. Captain Tang Di would replace the injured Captain Shi Mei Hao as the commander of 3rd Company. After noticing that Japanese troops were gathering at the southwestern side of the warehouse, Chinese soldiers on the roof dropped grenades and mortar rounds onto them, killing or wounding many of the Japanese soldiers and forcing them to retreat. By this point, it was already around the evening of the 27th. The men of the 1st Battalion were finally allowed a brief respite. The fighting going on at Sihang Warehouse did not escape the attention of those in the international settlement. For many, the distant explosions, the newly imposed curfew, and the influx of refugees were the only sign of the war going on around them. Life had remained relatively the same as the international settlement was relatively safe. This would have been the closest many of them would have gotten to the war so far. Journalists were also there to report on the story. Due to their proximity to the international settlement, the defenders were easily able to get in contact with the people outside and requested aid in the form of food. As the time for the start of the nightly curfew came around, the streets of the international settlement quickly quieted down. However, for the soldiers in the warehouse, there would be no sleep that night, as they continued to build fortifications as well as watched for potential Japanese attacks. No Japanese attack would materialize that night, and with that, the first day of battle at Sihang Warehouse came to an end.